problems. And I know some of you have questions from the homework, and we should be able to, uh, we'll cover topics that are related to those questions. And if we get through most of these, we can do specific ones that you're stuck on in the homework. But this should give you a model, at least, for each of those ones. And then uh, uh, we can work during the break, too, if you have questions that are specific that you feel like you didn't quite get answers to. Um, so let's just get started. The test is Thursday. And so main idea, well, you've seen that there's prior exams right here that you can look at. So there's going to be about 15 questions. Uh, you can't have a graphing calculator. And the other thing you can't use on these tests is these calculators. Because these have integral buttons. And that makes it very easy to get the answer. When you have an integral button and you're doing a problem that says integrate. So, and it's not really fair if some people have this one and the other calculators being used are just the more basic four function calculators. So you can't use this one either. So I'll bring a pile of those, you know, easier, simpler calculators just in case uh, you don't have one. Uh, so no graphing calculators, no phone calculators, and that one's totally fine. Yeah, so any, as long as there's not the integral button, that gives you a distinct advantage. <laughs> um, those of you taking tests at the testing center, I'm, I put, uh, there's four people in here that are taking at the testing center. Three at Westminster, one at Boulder County is what I have so far. I will change yours. I put it in at uh, Westminster, but I will switch it over to Boulder County. Will you send me an email today yeah. just to remind me so I, I may forget before the end of class because there's a lot going on. Okay, so let's go ahead and, s oh, you know, so we'll just start. No note cards, no phone calculators. We'll talk about the formulas you need to know. So on the final exam, you definitely can have no, you can have a formula sheet for that. But for the chapter exams, not. There's a handful of formulas, but a lot of times in Calc 2 and Calc 3, you know, the formula is the concept. Like if you have the formula for surface area and you're just plugging in the numbers, yeah, okay, that's an important skill. But understanding why the formula is what it is demonstrates that you're understanding what surface area is. So that's why in Calc 2 and Calc 3, we usually don't let you have formulas on chapter exams, because we're really focused on doing those examples again and again. And so the formula really is a big part of understanding the concept. You know, it shouldn't just be memorizing the formula, it should be understanding the formula. So that surface area formula, 2 pi r ds, we'll get to it. But 2 pi r is the circumference of a point that's being rotated around an axis. It gives us a circumference. And then the ds gives us the little frustum of a cone. But we'll, we'll look at that in detail as we get through. Um, and then, you know, the topics, these are all the topics we've covered. 7.3, we're only going to be looking at derivatives and integrals of the hyperbolic, so you don't have to really, you don't have to focus on all of those other identities. We just want to get the derivatives and integrals down because those functions will show up from time to time. But usually in most applications, that's all you need is a derivative or an integral. Um, okay, so let's go back to chapter six and we'll start with 6.1. And we won't do every single one of these. These are the exact problems in that My Math Lab assignment. So if you look at my math lab and you look at that exam one, uh, I forget what I titled it exactly, but you know, practice for exam one or whatever it is, uh, that's what these problems are. So we will start with the velocity. Uh, let's go ahead and do the first one here. I've got several examples for this. Uh, we don't need to do them all, but let's at least do one from every chunk here, every topic. So this velocity for us in chapter six, remember that we're dealing with the simplest type of motion. We're just bouncing around on a line. So you can think of a ball, you can think of a particle, you can think of whatever you want. It's just motion along a line. And so this velocity function is telling us the velocity at time t along the line. So this says determine the position function using both the antiderivative method and the fundamental theorem of calculus method. 
I'll just do it one method. I'm going to do it with the FTC method. You can use the antiderivative method. I'm fine with that. That tends to be a method that's, that's maybe a little more intuitive in some ways. Uh, but the method that the FTC method is the method that generalizes. It's the method that when you're going into other classes and you're trying to find, you know, if you're, if you're doing a population type thing, that's usually how they'll do it is with this method, with the FTC method. So if we want position uh, from velocity, do we integrate or do we differentiate? What do we do? Integrate, right? So we have that basic relationship that the integral of acceleration gives velocity and the integral of velocity gives position, right? We have that basic sort of set of three ideas, position, velocity, and acceleration. One direction you integrate, one direction you differentiate. So if we're going acceleration to velocity to position, we integrate. Going the other way, we would differentiate. Okay, so the position. We need to know where the particle is starting. So S of zero is the initial position. That's where it is. And then we want to know how far it's displaced on the time interval. And so this is what our basic formula looks like. So we have our position, and then this right here gives us the displacement. Did I start that? Yeah. Uh, and the function is given as a function of t. And we want to be a little careful because our interval is going to go 0 to t. This is going to allow us to end up with a function of t. And we can't have the same letter there as we do here. So we just change the dummy variable that's inside the integral that's not going to be there for long. We change it to an x or whatever your favorite letter is. And then we will plug away. So s of 0 is 3. So that is the initial position. And then we are going to find the uh, displacement by integrating the velocity function. So we'll integrate from 0 to t. We're going to put this function in. And we'll just change it to an x instead of a t because we already used t in our limit of integration. So any questions on that? Yeah, Oliver? Um, what is t supposed to be? What are, what, how long? T is time. So they're zoomed in on this interval from 0 to 4. We don't know why. Doesn't really matter. Could say 0 to 100. Could say anything. This interval, uh, maybe we have a secondary question that says, what's the distance traveled on this interval or whatever. So t is just representing some time, a moment in time in the interval of the domain. So whatever the domain happens to be, 0 to 4, you're imagining t as being some value, some future value. We know where we are at time 0, and then t is sort of some random future value. So we're predicting the location of the point in the future. That's what s of t is going to do. It's going to predict where the particle or point or ball or whatever it is, where it is in the future. That make sense? So then we do our standard integration here. Nothing too fancy here. We're going to get use the power rule, add 1 to the exponent, divide by the new exponent, and that goes 0 to t. So the antiderivative part here is this. We're going to be plugging the t and the 0 into this. The 3 is outside of that. <clears throat> so let's not get confused about what part is the antiderivative and what part is added to the antiderivative. So this is not part of what we're plugging the t and the 0 into. So when we plug in the t, all we're doing is replacing the x with t. And then we subtract off the antiderivative at 0. The antiderivative at 0 is 0. so. There is our position function. Normally, we'd write it in descending order. It does not matter, though. You can keep the 3 right there. That will be our position function at time t. So if we wanted to know the location at t equals 2, what are we going to do? Plug in 2. Plug in 2, exactly. 
So that is how this process works. So the other method using the antiderivative method is where you use an indefinite integral and you get a plus c and then you have to resolve the plus c and figure out what the constant is. But this is the preferred method. Either one is totally fine. Stop me if you have a question. So here's another one like that where we start from acceleration and we want to get all the way to position, so you'd integrate twice. This one is a more general one, so maybe, maybe we'll do this one. So this sort of generalizes that idea, and you see this a lot in applications, in, in, in a survey of calculus, business calculus, or in advanced biology classes or whatever, where you have some data about the rate at which a population is changing or the rate at which an account is changing, and we want to figure out <coughs> the future population. Um, when we're integrating twice, because I know in that, uh, the first example, you made it zero to t, yep. and then you switched it to t, like the whole thing switched to t. When we take the second integral, yep. would we now switch to x again. We would have to switch it back. Yep. Yeah, so the dummy variable just can't be a t because the t is always going to be the independent variable of your final answer. Okay. So when we do our integration, the, this variable is called the dummy variable because it's going to disappear, and whatever variable is up here is the one that will persist. Mm -hmm. okay. So we always, if there's a variable in the limit of integration, then we always choose a different letter for the dummy variable. So with this population one, we're going to have a similar type of setup. So we know that the future population will be the initial population. And you need to know how many, uh, what are we talking about here, how many bacteria. We need to know how many start in our population in order to predict how many will be there in the future. So we always do that, and then we're going to have plus the integral from 0 to t of the rate at which this population is changing, and we need to choose a different letter because we're going to use t in the limit of integration. So that n prime, that's an empirical number. You can go out and measure how fast the population is changing. So that's data that you can collect from the real world, and then this will allow us to build a model that predicts how big the population will be at some future time. So here they tell us um, that the rate of change is given by this exponential function, and they tell us that the initial population is 200. So we know that the future population will be how much we start with. That has a bearing on the future population. And then we're going to integrate from 0 to t the rate at which the population is changing. So that's our, that's our setup. Any questions on that setup? So this is our setup when we're using the FTC method. <clears throat> now this is an exponential function that we're integrating. And with an exponential function, whether you're integrating or differentiating, you get itself. Right? That's the beauty of the exponential function, that its derivative and integral are itself. And then we have a little bit of a modification because of this exponent. But the first step is that the integral of an exponential is itself. Let me just write that down. Oh, and I, what, what rule did I violate? Uh, yeah, this should be an X, or your favorite letter. Yeah, that should be an X. We don't want that to match, or it gets super confusing. Okay, so that should be an X right there, because we're integrating with respect to X. And what is the next step for this antiderivative? Reverse chain. Reverse chain rule, we're going to divide by the derivative of the exponent. So this is our RCR right here, reverse chain rule. I'm getting gross. So this is an exponent that's linear, which means we can use reverse chain rule. 
and reverse chain rule just says that we divide instead of multiply by the derivative of the exponent. If the question said to differentiate this exponential, the chain rule would say multiply by the exponent's derivative. But we're integrating, so we divide by the exponent's derivative. So is it your inner function that needs to be uh, linear? Yes. Okay. So for an exponential, the inner function is the exponent. For a trig function, the inner function is the angle. For a square root function, it's inside the root. Yeah, yeah that's right. And so then our limits of integration are 0 to t. Yeah? So instead of, so if we didn't know, because I didn't know, I didn't see it, um, mm -hmm. to use the RCR, mm -hmm. is that where, that I didn't use that instead? Yep, exactly. The so then it's going to gonna give you the same answer, it's just going to be extra work. It was. <laughs> yeah, yes, it will, it will most definitely be extra work. So you're going to end up with this, and then when you divide, here's your division that's going to match what we just did with RCR. There's the division by that number. Is that what RCR always, always. replaces? Is doing U sub? Okay. RCR always replaces U sub where the U is linear. linear. Yep, because whenever U is linear, the derivative is just that coefficient, and then you have to isolate your dx, so that's where the division comes from. Yeah, so that pattern will be the same every single time. And now here I saw there's a couple of, I've gotten a couple of Ask My Instructor emails about this one. We frequently see when you plug in zero that you get zero with your antiderivative value. But that is not the case with an exponential, right? When we plug in zero, we don't, we're not getting zero. So that was a super common pitfall. When we plug in the T, that's a no-brainer. Everyone, that one seems to be totally... Okay, no main issues with that. But this is where a lot of folks were getting hung up. They're like, oh yeah, plug in zero, you get zero. No, when you plug in zero, we end up with minus 50 divided by this decimal. E to the zero is one. So it's 50 times one, not 50 times zero. E to the zero is one. Uh, when we do an antiderivative, we evaluate at the upper limit of integration and we subtract off the antiderivative evaluated at the lower limit of integration. So it's always the upper limit minus the lower limit. So that's our function. And you can simplify this. I'm not going to do that part. You know how to do that. Um, and now the second part of the question said, what's the population after 14 days? So what do you think you do? Plug in 14 for the t. So n of 14 will approximately be whatever this is. You're going to replace t with 14. And that will and then type it into your calculator and approximate it to whatever they say to approximate to. All right, any questions on any of those steps? Let's get to our next topic. So area between curves, do we want to do an area between curve problem, or does area feel like that's OK? I had a question on the area between curves. Mm -hmm. when, you have, when you're revolving around the Y. We're not revolving. Oh, we're not revolving. Okay. Just area between two curves. Between curves. So if we're doing area between two curves and they're this direction, we're going to do upper curve minus lower curve. If they're this direction, we do right curve minus left curve. We'll, we'll do, area is going to be sort of built into what we're doing anyway, so let's uh, pass on it for now, because these other ones will incorporate area to some extent. So general slicing method. So when you, he, one important thing when you're doing homework is that you read the question repeatedly. It's really easy to disassociate what the question is asking and the technique that you're using to solve that question. It's very tempting when you're dealing with an online homework system. You, you, you sort of read through the question, but then you get hung up. You start looking at the help me solve this, the viewing example, and you kind of disassociate what the question was asking with what the technique is that you're doing. Super common issue. When you get to the test, you're like, oh, I just couldn't remember how to 
you know, how to approach it. And part of that is that you want to practice connecting the strategy that you're using to solve the problem with what the words in the question are asking. So just make sure that you're you know, rereading the question. Every time you're redoing it, make sure you're reading the question again to, to kind of connect those two together. So when you're asked a question, you don't feel like, oh gosh, I forget what technique it is that I need for this question. So when we see this general slicing, this is the type of solid that's given to us geometrically. So a general slicing means that we're given what a general cross section is going to look like. So they're geometrically describing the solid object. They're not doing a rotation. So the two types of solids we've seen are this general kind of geometrically describe the solid object and the here's a region in the xy plane now rotated around the x-axis or rotated around the y-axis. So we have two different strategies. And the general method, your cross sections could be anything. When we're rotating, we know that we're going to have disks, washers, or shells. Those are the three types of cross sections that we're going to have. But with these general things, you can have semicircle cross sections, you can have squares, you can have rectangles, you can have triangles. Okay, so this is different from the rotation ones. So general slicing, they tell us that we're going to start with uh, a triangle as our base. And so this base is going to look like that. Here is our triangular base right there. So that's the base of the solid, not the base of the cross section. We have to be really careful here because the word base can mean two different things. It can be the base of the solid, and if you have cross sections that are, say, triangles, we also call the bottom of the triangle the base. Or, you know, there, there's different, different interpretations of the word base. We have to be a little bit careful. So the, the solid whose base is the triangle and the cross sections are perpendicular to the base. So they say this every single time. Do not be confused by that phrase. Perpendicular to the base just means the cross sections are coming straight out of the page. They're not at some oblique angle, right? They're not, we're not taking... We're, we're creating these semicircles and they're not on some weird angle. They're perpendicular to the base. All right, so the solid object, we're just pulling vertically. The math word is extruding. So we're going to extrude perpendicular to the base. So that part is in every question and it's very easy to get tangled up on it. So that you can almost just ignore because that's always the case. Whenever we have our base, we're going to build our cross sections perpendicular to the base. The important part comes next parallel to the y-axis. So that tells us the direction of our integration element right there. What direction should, should we draw it, vertical or, per, or parallel? Uh, excuse me, vertical or horizontal? Mm -hmm. Horizontal. No, sorry, vertical. Vertical, because we want our integration element to be parallel to the y-axis. So there's four ways that they could state something there. They could say parallel to y, parallel to x, or they could say perpendicular to x or perpendicular to y. So there's four different things that could show up here. Parallel to x and perpendicular, parallel to y and perpendicular to x would be the same thing. This element is perpendicular to x and it's parallel to y. So there's two ways that they could describe that element. So parallel to y, there's our element. Now let's look at the cross-sectional shape. So from this element, you could come out and build squares, you could build a triangle, you could build semicircle, you could build all sorts of things. So what we want are semicircles. So these semicircles, we're just imagining this whole kind of array of semicircles. And if we sort of turned it on its side, it's kind of like half of a party hat, half of a birthday party hat almost. You know, where we've got these semicircles, it's kind of tilted though, you know, it's skewed, it's not symmetric. This triangle is not symmetric, but, but that's the idea. So we have all of these cross sections that are semicircles, and the diameters of those cross sections are getting tinier and tinier and tinier until we squeeze down to a point. All right, so it's kind of like half of a cone. All right, now what is <coughs> the area of a semicircle is one half pi r squared. 
area of a full circle is pi r squared, area of a semicircle would be half of that. Oops. Got it. So when we look, I'm going to take away some of these semicircles just so that we, when we look at our representative element here. So here is our representative element right there. That's at a random x. The radius for this semicircle is right here. That is the radius of a general semicircle. Many times, the main function in the problem sort of is the height, and you use that. But in this case, are we going to use that entire distance there? We're only going to use half of it, right? The blue element, that distance up there, is a diameter. When we find the area of a semicircle, we just need the radius. So, all right, we're going to take a peek at this curve then. We definitely need an equation for that curve. What is the equation for that curve? But what is the equation of this diagonal line right there? Negative x plus 2. Negative x plus 2. So y equals negative x plus 2. Let's talk about how we get that. So if you think about lines, if you go with the mx plus b thing, the slope of this line is negative 1. We go down 2 and over 2. So that's negative slope of 1. So that's the m, negative 1. And the y-intercept is 2. So that is, if you're comfortable with the y equals mx plus b, and you can see the b, and you can see the m, that's a great way to go. The other way that always works is the point slope method. You could say that points to 0, this points 0, 2. So you could use y minus y1 is equal to m times x minus x1 and pick either point. That would also give you the same equation. Now, do we need to rewrite this equation, or is that the correct form? Is that, is that equation measuring vertical distance or horizontal distance? Vertical. Since it's a y value, it's measuring vertical, and that's what we want. We do want to measure vertical. The thing we do have to modify is that we're finding the radius, so we will have to divide it by 2. So the radius then, this is going to lead us to the radius, which will then be negative x plus 2 divided by 2. That's going to be our radius. So the negative x plus 2 is this whole vertical distance from the x-axis up to the red, the red diagonal line, but the radius is only half of that, so we divide it by 2. So that tells us that the uh, area of, of our semicircle is going to be 1 half times pi times the radius quantity squared. <coughs> so that is the area of the semicircle at a random x. And if, you, if you're not 100% convinced that you have the right formula, check some endpoints. At zero, what is the radius of this semicircle right here that's right on the y-axis? The radius is 1. Right? That distance is 2, which is the diameter, so the radius is 1. And we know that the semicircle of radius 1 has area pi. If we have pi r squared, that would be the full area. We're plugging in a radius of 1, but we have to divide by 2. So pi over 2 should be the area of the very first semicircle. If we come over here and plug in 0, do we get the, we get, do we get the same answer? Let's see, pi r squared, pi r squared, why are we getting a slightly different answer? If we plug in 0 here, oh, no, no we don't. No, we don't. Yeah. I can't do arithmetic. <laughs> yeah, no, we get the same answer. Right, if we plug in 0 here, when I plugged in 0, I wasn't seeing that we get 2 over 2, which is 1. 1 squared is 1. So we do get pi over 2. So we have the right formula. I was going to ask, do you, should we leave it in like that form of minus x plus 2, or should we try, like simplify it in minus x over 2 plus 1? Doesn't matter. Okay. At some point, it's going to come out in the wash. So right here, when we square things, we definitely want to square it. We want to distribute this square so that we can integrate. So this is going to be minus x plus 2 quantity squared, and this 2 is squared to make a 4 there. So at some point, we do have to square it all out so that we can integrate it easily. 
So when this all gets simplified, we'll have 1 8th pi. And when we FOIL this, we will end up with that. So that is the area at x. And if we integrate it on the x interval, we'll get volume. Integral of area gives volume. So the volume, the 1 8th pi, comes to the front. We'll plug our area function into the integral. We're going to go from 0 to 2. That will be our volume. The integral of this power rule, plug in the 2, plug in the 0, you get your answer. So we'll focus more on the setup here because that's the hard part. Any setup issues there that you're not 100% sure on? Um, would it matter? Because we could use semicircles or squares or triangles. Mm -hmm. Is there a no, they just give it to us. Oh, they tell you. Yeah, they tell us. Oh, okay. So you have to know. If, we, if it was left up to us, would we ever choose semicircles? <laughs> Anytime we see a circle or semicircle, we know it's going to be harder than if it was just a square. So we would never choose that. Unless you're a contrarian. Cubes. Like, give me the semicircles. Yeah. Because if this was a square, let's, let's answer that question. If the cross sections were squares, which is super common, what about the area of the square? If our cross sections were squares, so this is if. So if our cross sections are squares, what is the side length for this square? X. Negative x plus 2. Negative x plus 2. Right, negative x plus 2 is measuring this vertical distance right here. And if we say that we're going to build squares, then this is one side length for the square. So the area of our square would be minus x plus 2 quantity squared. So this would be the area of the square at x. We'd have to integrate that. We wouldn't have the pi business out in front. That make sense? Yeah, so it depends on what the shape is that they give us. So let's try, uh, let's, let's pass on the disk one just because we're going to do washers, which are basically a double disk one. Let's just mention here that if we were going to do a disk method for this going around the x-axis, I want to remind you that for a disk or a washer, the integration element is perpendicular to the axis of rotation to create a disk or a washer. It's parallel to the axis of rotation if we're going to create a cylinder, a, a shell. So if we were going to do this with the disk method, the area of our disk is going to be pi r squared, which in this case, the radius is the function. So it's going to be pi times that squared, and when we simplify this, there would be our area. Oh, where'd the two go? So I squeeze, so, oh, no, 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 that's right, that's right. Power to power, you multiply. Power to power, you multiply. There's no square. Power to power, you multiply. So that's how we would set up our disk for this one. So make sure element is perpendicular to axis. So let's go ahead and work out a washer one, because that's going to be two disks in one, unless someone has a question on the area of a disk. So let's look at the washer one. So here, find the volume of the solid when the region, blah, blah, is rotated around the x-axis. All right, so the first thing we know is that we're going around x, and that dictates whether we choose a vertical or a horizontal integration element. They tell us, and I will tell you on the test, I will tell you, um, oh, they actually didn't tell us here. <laughs> I will tell you on the test to use washers or to use shells. So I will tell you which to use. This is in the washer section. And if we want to create a washer, should the integration element be vertical or should it be horizontal? I'm hearing both. So we are going to choose vertical because if we want to create a washer, 
The integration element has to be perpendicular to the axis to create the washer. If it's parallel, it's going to create a cylinder. So if we were told to use shells, then we would use a horizontal element going around x. So there is our random representative element at a random x. And now we have to decide. If we're using washers, we have to decide where is the inner radius and where is the outer radius. This distance to the closer curve is the inner radius. The distance from the further curve to the axis of rotation, that is our outer radius. So we're creating an annulus, a washer. So there's our inner. We're creating this washer. There's our, our outer. And we basically find the area of the big disk, subtract off the area of the little disk, and that will give us the area of the washer. That will give us the area you know, in here. OK, so let's write down that generic formula. The area of a washer is pi multiplied by the outer radius squared minus the inner radius squared. So there's our generic formula for a washer, area of a washer. OK. Do we need to rewrite these equations, or are these equations measuring vertical distances? They're measuring vertical distances because they both have y isolated, and y measures vertical distance, x measures horizontal distance. So we're good to go. So no funny business there. What is the outer radius? 32 root x. It is the curve that is furthest from the axis of rotation. So that is the 32 root x, and that quantity is then squared. And then how about the inner radius? 8x. That quantity is also squared. So now we have the outer area minus the inner area, which is going to give us the area of the washer. Anything nagging at you in terms of identifying R, I, R sub i or R sub o? Does it feel obvious? Good. Hopefully it'll feel obvious on Thursday, right? OK, so now we're going to square this. Um, 32 squared. Anyone have 32 squared on hand? 1,024. 10, thank you. Oh, no, no square there, and that's a square. All right, so there is our area formula. So again, this is the area formula at x. So if you imagine this whole stacking of washers side by side, you can imagine this infinite collection of washers stacked side by side. That tells you the area at each of these x values. Now, one question we have to ask ourselves is the interval upon which we're integrating. So we need to know the x value at each of those two points, because right? that's where the washers are. The one on the left is x equals 0, but we don't know what the x on the right is yet. So how do we find where two curves intersect? We do a simultaneous solve. We set them equal to each other. That's how we're going to find our endpoints for the integration interval. Let's cancel out the, the uh, common factor of 8 before we do anything. Anytime we have a square root equation and we want to solve it, we square both sides. You isolate the square root and then square both sides so we can square it at this moment. So we're squaring both sides right here. So we square both sides. And then once we have that equation, we pull everything to one side and factor. That's our standard procedure for a nonlinear equation. Everything to the left and factor. Or everything to the right and factor. It does not matter. Everything to one side and factor. So I'm going to write it this way. So I have a positive leading coefficient. Always easier. Positive leading coefficient. Factor out an x. 
And this tells us our two intersection points. One is at x equals 0, and one is at x equals 16. And that will be our limit. Those will be our limits of integration. So our volume will be the integral from 0 to 16. integrating our cross-sectional area to get the volume of our solid object. Let's do the integration. And yes, if we wanted to factor out the common factor of 64, we could factor that out. We'll just pause. We'll wait. So x squared over 2, so this will be 512x squared minus 64 thirds x cubed, and this will be 0 to 16. Let's see, I'm going to go right there. <clears throat> Plugging in the 0 doesn't contribute anything, so we just have to focus on the 16. We'll have to do a little bit of arithmetic in here. Well, 512 times 16 squared is 256, I believe. Minus 64 over 3. And 16 cubed, whatever that is. I'll just write it as 256 times 16. <laughs> so we just have to type all that in, turn it into a fraction, and leave the pi. So whatever we get for that. Let's see if we can all come up with the same answer. <clears throat> Do we know how to use our calculators properly? Change it to a fraction. Oh, mine won't change to a fraction, right? Huh. So, so if it doesn't change it to a fraction, we have to go back and do the algebra trick. So it's that. So I'm coming up with, so this is 4, 3, 6, 0, and 2 thirds pi. So we don't want that answer. We don't use mixed numbers. So we multiply that, add 2, um, and divide by 3. Is that confirmed by at least two people? <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Okay, any questions on the wa on the, the radii of the washer, the area of the washer? Yeah? Um, finding where the curves intersect, mm -hmm. is that just for washer? Would you use that is for everything. For everything, okay. yeah. Yeah, that's universal. If you have two curves that intersect, you set them equal to each other and do a simultaneous solve. Because we want to know where they share a point. Let's do a shell method. OK, so this is a complicated looking function. That's not a function I would expect you to be able to graph by hand. If I was going to ask you to do something with this function, I would definitely give you a graph if the graph was necessary. So we've got our curve. We've got the x-axis and the y-axis. And we have x equals 2. And we are told here to use the shell method. So that will be like on the test. I will tell you which method to use to find the volume of the solid when it's rotated around the y-axis. So we're going to go around y. And if we're going to use a shell method, that means we want our representative cross sections to be cylinders. Will we choose a vertical integration element or a horizontal integration element? Vertical, because we want the integration element to be parallel to the axis that it's rotating around to create a cylinder. So we pick a random vertical element at x. Now we have to, I, let's write down first the area of a cylinder. That's going to be the circumference of the base, 2 pi r, times the height. Area of a cylinder. Find the distance around the bottom of the cylinder. That's called the circumference. Multiply it by its height. That will give us the area 
of the cylinder. So now when we look at our graph, we have to find the R and we have to find the H. So the R is this distance right there. Wherever we put our representative element, the distance it is from the axis of rotation, that is the radius. Right? When that vertical element rotates around the y-axis, its distance to the axis of rotation is the radius. And the height is literally the height of the element. Mm -hmm. All right. So before we write down the R and the H, think to yourself, are we integrating with respect to X or are we integrating with respect to Y? And what do you think? We're going to integrate with respect to x so that we have a dx inside the integral. And if we have a dx in the integral, these things have to be turned into some sort of x expressions. Right, we need only x's. You can't integrate with respect to x and have y. So we know that gives us a little bit of foreshadowing, we know we are going to have a dx, so we know that we should be turning these two variables here into x's. All right, what should the radius be? <coughs> x. All right, the distance to the axis of rotation for the random element that we drew at a random x, the distance it is to the axis of rotation is x. How about the height? It is the function, right? That function is measuring what we are referring to as the height of the cylinder. That <coughs> function is measuring the distance from the x-axis up to the curve. And that's going to create the height of the corresponding cylinder. <laughs> All right. So let me just, I'm going to write this this way. I'll tell you why in a second. Maybe as I'm writing down this next thing, think about why I might want it to have written it that way. So the volume of our solid object will be the integral of that area function. And they tell us the limits of integration in this case. They say our solid object is going to be created by this region from 0 to 2. So we know the limits of integration. What form is this integrating in? Log form. Log form is where the denominator's derivative is the numerator. If it's in log form, we can cut right to the chase. We could use u substitution and throw in a few extra steps if we want. But if it's in log form, we know the answer. Anything in log form is going to integrate to the natural log of the absolute value of the denominator every single time. If the numerator is the derivative of the denominator, that is log form. And you know the integral of 1 over x dx is natural log absolute x. That's the pattern. It's not maybe totally jumping out at you because you know, there's such simple numerator and denominator, but that's the pattern. The derivative of x is 1. So anything in log form, wherever the derivative of the denominator is the numerator, you just cut to the chase. Will u substitution work? Of course. Let u be the denominator, and it will work out just fine. You'll get integral of du over u. Bless you. OK, so. Let's plug in, plug in our limits of integration. So we're going to have pi natural log of, um, let's see, 4. Plug into the 2 there. 4 times 8 is 32, plus 1, 33, minus natural log of 1. Natural log of 1 is 0. So our final <coughs> answer will be pi ln 33. Any issues 
that you're seeing that you're not quite grasping. With all of these volume ones, regardless of whether it was general slicing or disc or washer or shell, the first step is to figure out your basic area, area of your cross section. What is the area of the cross section? If the cross section is a cylinder, we have that. If it's a disc, it's pi r squared. If it's a washer, it's pi r squared minus pi r squared. All right, so that's the first thing. And we just integrate area to get volume. So if we can find that cross-sectional area, then we just integrate. What about, let's see, that's a little more work. That's, that's a little too heady for, if we have time, we could go back and look at this. So it says to use the shell method to find the volume of the solid when a hole of radius three is drilled out symmetrically along the axis of a right circular cone. So it's kind of like the napkin ring problem that we did. So the napkin ring problem, we had a ball and we drilled out the middle. Very similar, it's just that here we have a cone and we're gonna drill out the middle. So you can see how a shell method would be very natural. There's gonna be a bunch of shells that are concentrically aligned and there's a big hole in the middle. But that's a little more complicated than we need to look at. This, though, is much more practical. And on review day, we want to be very practical. So let's go for this one. So random axis. This is where we really can figure out if we're understanding the concepts when you have a random axis. With the coordinate axes, you can kind of stumble into the right area of your cross section. Let's, this, this will really test us, though. So first, let's draw the region. So this is a region I would expect you to be able to draw really easily, really quickly. So y equals x squared, looks like that. We're going to go x equals 1, which is a vertical line. y equals 0 is the x-axis. So we're going to have something like this. Bless you. So there's 1. This is going to be 1 comma 1, and that's 0 comma 0. And this is y equals x squared. OK. Now, they're telling us to rotate around a line, x equals negative 7. Looks like I need some space to the left of the y-axis. So let's get our axis of rotation out here. Let's do it in blue. So here's our axis of rotation at x equals negative 7. OK, shell method. Vertical or horizontal element if we're rotating around that line right there? Uh, vertical. vertical, because we want our integration element to be parallel to the axis of rotation. With a vertical element, it's a random element, we put it at a random x. Horizontal element, we put it at a random y. We know that we're using a cylindrical shell, so we are asked to find the area of a random cylinder, that's 2 pi times the radius times the height. That's how you find the area of a cylinder. 2 pi r, circumference, times the height. Now we come over to our picture, and we have to identify the r and the h. So the r is the distance from the axis of rotation over to the element that's going to create your cylinder. That is the radius of the corresponding cylinder. The height, that's usually very straightforward because the height in almost every single case is just whatever the length of your element is. That's usually jumping right out at us. Okay, so now before we start plugging stuff in here, let's do the little foreshadow step. With a vertical element, should we have a dx or a dy? dx, because you can think of dx as the thickness of that vertical element. So we know that the R and the H have to turn into X's. Because everything in the, inside the integral has to be X's. <clears throat> OK, what is R? X plus, X plus 7. Is that obvious to everyone? X plus 7. There are two ways to do that. So if we want a horizontal distance, the right x minus the left x. That's how we do horizontal distance, right minus left. So we look at our radial distance right here. 
the right x is just x. The left x is negative 7. x minus minus 7 is x plus 7. So that is, that is the very mathy way to do it. It's to sort of uh, use that principle that horizontal distances are right x minus left x. The other way is more geometric. What do these things mean? Well, this x right there, that's measuring this distance, right? That distance is x. That's what it's measuring. It's measuring the distance from the y-axis over. And then over here, you look and say, oh, well, that distance is 7. Right? The distance from the origin over to negative 7 is 7. The distance is 7. So then the total distance is x plus 7. So you can think of it very geometrically, or you can just do it very mathy. That's the right x minus the left x. You know, whatever your, whatever your instinct is. And then the height is the function. So there is our cylinder's area. And that is the bulk of the problem. The next step should be very routine because we're just integrating with the power rule. But there are the concepts. The concepts are right there. Finding the area of a cylinder where we have a non-coordinate axis, radi non axis rotation. We could, the, we could also we could have a washer or a disc, like if um, we wanted to use a horizontal element here, we would have washers. If the axis of rotation happened to be say right there, and we rotated this way, and we used a horizontal element, we'd have discs. So you could definitely have all three, um, even with a general axis of rotation. Okay. Yeah, all three are still candidates. So the, the volume in this case then, we'll pull the 2 pi out in front, integral, we'll distribute the x squared, so we're going to integrate this function right here, limits of integration. What do we think the limits of integration are? Zero to eight. No. Zero to one. Oh. Do we see it? So we have to physically visualize where the cylinders are coming from. Right in this interval from 0 to 1, right here, this is where the cylinders are coming from. Right? We imagine this infinite collection of vertical elements. They're creating this, these concentric cylinders. But this physical interval right here is where they're coming from. Right? If you integrate it from 0 to 8, you're asking for some region that's um, you know, bigger than one, 0 to 1. So we physically want to look at our region and where the vertical elements live. So they're in this interval from 0 to 1. And then again, super, uh, uh, power rule. So nothing, nothing very mysterious with the actual integration in this context. So we integrate 0 to 1, 0 doesn't contribute, so we just have to do 1 fourth plus 7 thirds, <coughs> common denominator of 12, so we'll have 3 plus 28 divided by 12, so we'll end up with 31 pi over 6. What if the axis of rotation, so let's do a what if thing. Let's just come down this way. Let's suppose we had an axis of rotation down here. Let's suppose we went that way. Let's just leave the vertical element alone. Let's go with the vertical element. Let's set it up with washers. And let's just find the area of the washer. So if we were going to go around this line down here, and let's suppose that this is um, y equals negative 8, let's just identify the area of the washer. So pi times, so we're going to use the same exact element right there. We're going to go with a washer. What is the outer radius? x 
x squared plus 8. Mm. Outer radius gets squared. So let's see. Do we all understand why it's x squared plus 8? The outer radius is right here, goes to the, the furthest function. This distance right here is 8. Right? Between the x-axis and, and the axis of rotation is 8. That distance up there is x squared. So it's x squared plus 8. That's the geometric way. Or vertical distance, top y minus lower y. The y value right there is x squared. The y value right there is negative 8. So it's x squared <coughs> minus minus 8, which is that. So there's the outer radius minus inner radius squared. What's the inner radius? Yeah, which is 8. Everyone agree? The inner radius, so the lower curve is this highlighted x-axis piece. That's the lower curve. This is the upper curve to that element. That's the lower curve. This distance here, no matter where you draw your vertical element, it's always right there on the x-axis, so that distance is 8. So that would be our setup if we did a washer around another axis. All right, let's go ahead and take our 10-minute break. And anyone that has questions on anything we've done so far, or homework questions, resume. So that one All right, so let's do some arc length and surface area. Those integrals tend to be the gnarly ones. But if you do one little thing wrong, you are, you know, plummeted into the hell realm. So you have to be very meticulous and careful with your derivative and squaring it. So let's go ahead and take a look at this arc length one. So our general formula for arc length, we know that ds is the square root of 1 plus y prime squared times dx. So that is our general formula for ds. Arc length which we use a little less to represent, is just the integral of ds. <clears throat> but once again, we don't know anything about s, so we have to convert to x. So that is the formula that connects us to x's. So here is our function. We need its derivative squared, and we need to add 1. So first thing we know we need to do is find the derivative of that curve. So we use the power rule. We bring down the 4 thirds, subtract 1. 4 thirds times 3 fourths is 1. So we're going to end up with x to the 1 third minus. Here we're going to bring down the 2 thirds. And the twos are going to, the 2 will cancel with the 8 given a 4. The 3s are going to cancel. We'll end up with minus 1 fourth x to the minus 1 third. Derivative of 6 is 0. So that is our derivative. If we get that wrong, Everything that follows is just going to be a domino effect of misery. So if you see arc length or surface area, when you take your derivative, triple check that your derivative is correct. So we did the power rule. We brought down the 4 thirds. 4 thirds times 3 fourths is 1. Subtract 1 from 4 thirds. So you're subtracting out 3 thirds. For this next one, you have you have 6 over 24. When you bring down the 2 thirds, you're going to get 6 over 24, which is a fourth. Subtract 1 from 2 thirds, and you go negative, negative 1 third. Okay. So super double check, triple check that derivative, because as soon as you go on with the wrong derivative, no fun. Yes. Yeah, you could integrate this to get back to that. Yeah, that's a good way to double check. The integral of that should give you that. So add 1 and divide. Yep. So now we're squaring this. And here's where I will tell you on the test if, I, if it's going to be what we call the tricky trinomial problem. I'll tell you. But here's where you would notice with this squaring. And so my recommendation is that you don't square it all out. You just sort of wait patiently. So we're going to square the A. We're going to square the B. And um, in the middle term, remember that for a perfect square trinomial, if you have a minus b squared, so we have a minus b right here, the trinomial is a squared minus 2ab plus b squared. 
So that's the part I'm doing right now. This, this is A, this is B, so A squared, B squared, don't simplify it. <clears throat> but now the middle term is going to be negative 2AB, so negative 2, A is x to the 1 third, B is x to the minus 1 third divided by 4, so I'll put the divided by 4 down here for whatever reason x to the 1 third times x to the minus 1 third? 1. All right. x to the 1 third times x to the minus 1 third. You add the exponents, you get x to the 0, which is 1. 2 divided by 4 is a half. So what we notice is that the middle term is minus 1 half, and that's got a plus in front of it there. So that's what we have. So we have the x to the 1 third squared. We have 1 quarter x to the minus 1 third squared. But the middle term is minus 1 half. And here's how we know we're in a perfect square trinomial. If you get that minus 1 half, what's going to happen when we add the 1 from up here, when we add that 1 right there inside the ds, then we notice that the only thing that changed is the sign of the middle term. And if the only thing that changes is the sign of the middle term, then we have another perfect square trinomial. So if we start with a minus b and we square it down to here, and then we add 1, and the only thing that changed is the middle term, that's back over here. So if we start, if we start there at a minus b and we square it and we get this, and then we add 1, and the only thing we did was change the sign of the middle term. Then we can factor it into a plus b squared. So this whole thing here is just going to factor right back into a plus b quantity squared. So we started with a minus b. We squared it. That gave us a perfect square trinomial right here. We added 1. And the only thing that changed was the sign. If the only thing that changes is the sign between these two trinomials, if that one's a perfect square, then that one's a perfect square. If that one's a minus b squared, then this one is a plus b squared. So that's kind of the, the, the clever way to do these. If you, for, if you multiply this out, you will be, again, spiraling into chaos because you will never recognize that it's a perfect square trinomial if you write it. If you were to write this as x to the 2 thirds, and you're going to rewrite this as x to the minus 2 thirds over 16 minus a half, you will never recognize that that's a perfect square trinomial. You need to sort of be familiar with this idea, that if two trinomials only differ in sign, and one of them's a perfect square, then the other one's a perfect square. So that's going to be our, our trick. And that's beautiful because now we come down to our arc length formula, which says integrate the square root of this. And I forget the x's went from 1 to 27. And now the square root and the square are just going to cancel each other out. So we end up with a very tidy little integral with the power rule being all we need to understand. And that turns it into something very manageable. But there's that kind of tricky algebra in between. So here, once we get to that, then we can integrate with the power rule. And let's notice that at this step that we should also have, a, there's a little mental check. If you know you're dealing with that crazy, perfect, tricky, perfect square trinomial, so notice your antiderivative there. If you come all the way back up to the beginning, the only difference from the original function 
and that is what? This, oh, do I have a, I should have a, I think my sign is, something feels wrong with the sign. That one should be plus? Oh, because when I add one to this, I get a positive two-thirds, not a negative two-thirds. When you add one to this, you add three-thirds, you get two-thirds. Dividing by two-thirds is multiplying by three halves. So that should be that. Yeah, thank you. But the check is that it should match everything but the sign. So it's good that we did that check because my sign was wrong. <laughs> and any questions up to that point? All right, so then plugging in the 27, plugging in the 1. So we, now we just have some antiderivative business. 27 is a perfect cube. So when we plug it in here, we always do the denominator first. Cubed root of 27 is 3, so we end up with 3 raised to the fourth power, which is 81. Plus 3 eighths. Plug in the 27 here. Third root of 27, it's a perfect cube. Cubed root of 27 is 3. 3 squared is 9. And then minus 3 fourths, minus 3 eighths, et cetera. You can do the arithmetic there. <clears throat> All right, so that one makes sense? That kind of matches the one that we were just looking at. <clears throat> Any perfect square trinomial questions? Perfect square trinomials, you can, if you want to just sort of play with perfect square trinomials, the thing that makes some of these problems hard, harder, is they have all these weird exponents and coefficients. Like if you play around with some perfect square trinomials that have integers instead of these fractions, that could help to you know, familiarize yourselves with how the two perfect squares are working, if you want. It's amazing. You add fractions and things just get hectic. All right, so let's take a look at this one. So here we are presented with a function of y instead of a function of x. So first off. And notice they give us a y interval. And uh, they, yeah. And so all that means is that we're going to integrate with respect to y instead of x. So for finding arc length, if we have a function of y, we're integrating with respect to y. So we need y limits of integration. If we're given a function of x, we're integrating with respect to x, so we need x limits of integration. So they've set it up fine for us. We know we need the derivative. So the derivative is going to be, pull down the 4, 4 is cancel, subtract 1. We're going to rewrite that 8y squared. Think of it as 8y to the negative 2, excuse me, 1 eighth y to the negative 2. When you differentiate, pull down the negative 2, so you're going to have negative 1 fourth y to the negative 3. <clears throat> Everyone agree with that derivative? And if you want, you can double check by integrating or just doing the derivative again. Make sure that you did the power rule right. Now we need to square it because our ds is the square root, in this case, it's 1 plus x prime squared times a dy. So x prime squared, that, again, let's not foil it all out. Let's just leave the first and the last term alone, write it as an a squared and a b squared. And let's focus on the middle term, because if it's minus half, then we know it's the tricky perfect square trinomial. So it's minus 2 times a times b. And maybe I'll write the b with a positive exponent on the y. So it looks like that. And then it becomes super obvious that this middle term is minus 1 half because the y cubes cancel. And 2 divided by 4 is a half. When you're trying to identify a and b, remember that the minus sign is not included. 
there's A, there's B. So there's A minus B squared. Now when we add 1 half, excuse me, when we add 1, we end up with a middle term that is positive 1 half. So we add 1. We add 1 to both sides. That changes the middle term to plus half. So once again, if this one up here is a perfect square trinomial, and all we do is change the sign of the middle term, then that one has to be a perfect square trinomial. So this is really y cubed plus 1 quarter y to the negative 3 squared. <clears throat> and then our arc length is the integral of the square root of that. And they gave us the y interval 3 to 4. So we know that the limits of integration are 3 and 4. <coughs> yeah, so when we take the square root of all this, <coughs> those cancel. We're just integrating the y cubed plus 1 quarter y to the negative 3. Do the integral. We get y to the 4 over 4. Add 1 to the exponent here. We get y to the negative 2. And here's our mental check. That, that antiderivative should look, if it's a perfect square trinomial problem, it should match except for the sign. <clears throat> Plug in the 4. 1, 4 cancels. So we have 4 cubed, which is 16 times 4, which is 64, minus. This is going to be 1 divided by 4 squared is 16. 16 times 8, 16 times 8 is 128, you have the denominator. And then we subtract off the antiderivative evaluated at our lower limit of integration. 3 to the 4th is 81, so we'll have minus 81 over 4, plus, we're subtracting this antiderivative, so minus and then plus. 3 squared is 9. 9 times 8 is 72. And then we add those together and turn it into a fraction. And that'll be our arc length. <clears throat> All right, any questions on those arc length steps? Ready for surface area? OK, let's take a look at a surface area one. So surface area has arc length built into it. So we'll see a little more of that square root. So first off, our generic surface area formula, we think of the surface area as the integral of 2 pi r ds. The 2 pi r is circumference. And the ds is slant height of a frustum. Or you think of it as arc length. OK. So they give us a function. They say the graph of 3x, we know that 3x is just a steep line. Looks something like that. We don't have to get super precise. And they say, let's look on the interval 3 to 7. So we have this kind of setup where we've got a piece of that line y equals 3x on the interval 3 to 7. And we are going to rotate it around the x-axis. So in your mind, 
you're thinking about coming up to the curve, and we think about a representative point on that curve. And when it rotates around, it creates a circumference. That's the 2 pi r that we're talking about. So when that point rotates around the x-axis, it creates a circle. And the radius of the circle is right there. The radius of the circle is given by the function y equals 3x. So surface area will be 2 pi. So what is r going to be in this case? We're going to see 3x. Right? This function 3x, y equals 3x, that is measuring the distance to this axis of rotation. So that point, when it rotates around, the circle that it creates is a circle with this radius, and that's the radius, 3x. So 2 pi r, and then ds. ds is that square root business that we just did in the arc length. All right, well, if we're going to build a ds, we need to find y prime. y prime is 3. y prime squared is 9. y prime squared plus 1 is 10. And that is what goes inside the square root. I don't need a square root that big. So this is the square root of 10 dx. So no matter what, with all of these, ds is the square root of 1 plus y prime squared. That does not want to, hmm. does not like that area for some reason. So we'll be sneaky. <clears throat> so 1 plus y prime squared, put it inside the square root. And lo and behold, this surface area one actually works out very nicely because we have just a constant in there. So we'll get 6 square root 10 times pi x squared over 2 when we do the integration. Limits are 7 up top and 3 down below. So when you look at that setup, is there something that you're not sure about? So for surface area, we have the 2 pi r. That's the only thing that changes from arc length. So for arc length, we still we're still doing this arc length piece. We're still doing the 1 plus y prime squared square rooted. That's still part of, the, part of the mix. The only difference is we throw a 2 pi r in front. r is always the function. ds, in this case, the arc length turns into just a constant square root of 10. So, any questions? 2 pi r ds? <coughs> 2 pi r ds. Going once, going twice, gone. Let's do one more. So here's another one. This one is going around the y-axis. So, what we've said with arc length and surface, well, what we've said with arc length, if we're given a function of x, we integrate with respect to x. If we're given a function of y, we integrate with respect to y. With surface area, if we're going around x, we integrate with respect to x. If we go around y, we integrate with respect to y. Notice here, here they commingle things. So they say we're going to go around the y-axis. So if we're going around the y-axis, we should have y limits of integration, and we should have this written as an x value, not a y value. If we're going to rotate around y, the distance to the y-axis is x. 
And so we need to change this. We're going to need to present this as an x value if we're rotating around the y-axis. So we're going to cube both sides. And then we're going to isolate x. So here is the function of y that's being wrapped around the y-axis. How about the limits of integration? How do we convert those over to y values? Plug them into the function. So when x is 0, we want the corresponding y value. So we plug it in right there. 3 times 0 is 0. 0 cubed root is 0. Plug in the other x value, the right endpoint. x is 8 thirds. The 3's cancel. We have 8 to the 1 third, which is 2. So now we have things just like the last one. So let's just jump back for a second. Big picture. Here, we were rotating around x. So we're going to integrate with respect to x. So we need x limits of integration. If we're integrating around, if we're rotating around the y-axis, we need y limits of integration. And we're going to integrate with respect to y. All right, so there is our function. We can now find the derivative and do the whole, so we know that ds, we can do this whole derivative thing. So we have 1 plus x prime squared dy. So x prime, pull down the 3 and subtract 1. I think we just get, x, uh, just get y squared. So then we square it, x prime squared. We can square it and add 1 at the same time because this one is not too complicated. So we get that. <clears throat> All right, so this is going to be kind of like the one that we were talking about up here. So surface area, big S, is 2 pi r times ds. There is our generic formula, 2 pi r ds. 2 pi r is the circumference, ds is the slant height. So what is the radius in this case? Right here. So the radius is the distance over to the axis of rotation. That's what this function measures. It's the function. So 1 third y cubed, there's the radius. And then the ds is the square root of x squared, x, x prime squared plus 1. So we have y to the fourth plus 1 dy. Our y limits we found to be 0 and 2. So in the homework in 6.6, .6, there's a couple of viewing example problems for surface area that are very convoluted. You had some probably graduate students writing down answers and solutions, and they're just trying to be super clever. And what we know is that we need u substitution here. And so what we would like with u substitution, if it's easy, it's nice if you can manipulate the front so that the front is the derivative of what's inside, if it's easy. The homework problems, there's a couple that have weird fractions like 2 ninths or 21 thirty-fourths or whatever. And if you look at the viewing example that helped me solve this, they like do this crazy arithmetic thing to make the derivative of the inside right there. Totally unnecessary. If you can do it easily and it's obvious, yeah, sure, do it. That makes your substitution a bit easier. If it's not obvious, don't do it. Just do use substitution. So in this case, we would have to have a 4y cubed. So in this case, it's pretty easy because we could just factor out the 1 third and we could multiply by 4 and then offset it by dividing by 4. It's pretty easy in this case. Let's just do regular u sub, though. We're going to let u be the inside of the root. So du is 4y cubed dy. And when we look at our integral here, let me pull out the constant first so that we have 2 pi over 3. Let's just rewrite it so we have just this as our integrand. 
So our target then is that we're trying to replace that y cubed dy. So the only thing we have to do over here is just isolate y cubed dy. So if you had a fraction in front that was 4 21st or something, you just move it to the other side. So here we'll just move the 4 over. Bingo. We have now isolated y cubed dy right there, so that can be replaced with d over 4. So in that homework problem or on that quiz, do it like that. Pull out everything except the y cubed. It'll be way easier than trying to manipulate it. So then when we go to do our substitution, we have 2 pi thirds in front. Come in, oops, limits are going to be different. Come inside here, so we let u be y to the fourth plus 1, so we're going to get a u to the 1 half. And then y cubed times dy, that part right there, that's du over 4. And the over 4, <coughs> if you want to write it inside the integrand at first, that's fine. You can just pull it right out in front, though. Division by 4. Put it right there. Totally fine. So there is our du over 4. So there is over 4, right there. du over 4. And then our limits of integration have to be modified. These two limits of integration are y's. But now we have u. So we look right there. There is how you exchange y's for u's. You put in a y. You get out of u. So if we plug in 0 for y, we get 1 for u. And what about if we plug in 2 for y? 17? So if we plug in 2 for the y, we get 2 to the 4, which is 16 plus 1. All right. So simplifying out in front a little bit, 2 cancels, so we'll get 5 or 6. We get y, uh, u to the 3 halves multiplied by 2 thirds, 1 to 17. So we're going to have 17 to the 3 halves minus 1 to the 3 halves, antiderivative at the upper endpoint minus antiderivative at the lower endpoint. And normally, we'll simplify this. This would be the preferred form right there. So we've seen a lot of those 3 halves powers. So we think of it mentally as the square root of 17 multiplied by itself three times, which would simplify to this. One to any power is itself. Any issues? This one, definitely a little bit more thinking because this function is not presented in the way that it needs to be for an axis of rotation of the y-axis. <clears throat> All right, should we do some applications? Let's see, spring. Let's look at the spring. So the spring problem. The, that was the first force example that we looked at where we integrated force to get work. And what we will do is use Hooke's Law. So force is kx. <coughs> Thank you. Force is kx. So force is a linear function. Right? Power in x is 1. That's a linear function. Favorite kind of functions, right? OK, so this says that. We've got a shock. It's compressed 2 centimeters from equilibrium with a mass of 700 kilograms. How much work is required to uh, compress the shock? 4 centimeters from equilibrium. So first thing, we notice that there's some unit issues. We will always want to be in meters so that we can end up with work in uh, terms of uh, uh, newton meters so, or joules. 
And so we want to convert these centimeter numbers. Two centimeters is how many meters? 0 0.02 meters. 100 centimeters per meter. So we'll just convert those over. OK, so anytime we have a spring, we need to know what its spring constant is. So this is going to tell us right here. This is a data point. So it's compressed two centimeters from equilibrium uh, mass of 700 kilograms. So now they're telling us something. Remember that this is force on this side, not mass. And how do we get to force from mass? So a mass exerts a force of 700 g. This g is the gravity g, right? Not, not grams. So force is mass times acceleration. Force is mass times acceleration. So in a lot of the problems they gave us that we wanted to find the k, they gave us F as a force. They gave us this side as a force. They just said it takes X number of newtons. Here, they're giving us it as a mass. Well, we convert it to newtons just by multiplying by gravity. So our data point here is that on the left, we have 700 kilograms. We multiply by G, which is 9.8. And that is going to be the displacement. It's compressed two centimeters. So if we compress it two centimeters, 0 0.02 meters times k. So if we solve that for k, that is the spring constant for this spring. So that will be our initial value that allows us to get to that spring constant. So 700 times 9.8 divide 0 0.02. So our spring constant is quite large. which you would expect because we're dealing with a heavy duty shock absorber in a car, we're not just dealing with a slinky. So that spring constant is going to be very large. So whenever, sorry. Go ahead. Um, whenever you calculate spring constant, what, what is that telling you for the problem? Like this gives us the constant. So this tells us then that for this particular spring, this is the force function that we are going to deal with. So the spring constant tells us what the linear function is that gives us the force for this function. Okay. So that's what it tells us. So they have to give us, and most of the time what they're going to give us is this and this, and they're going to give us some initial values that allow us to find that spring constant for this particular spring. So it's just that in this case, a lot of the problems, they give us newtons right away. Here, they don't give us newtons. They give us mass. And if we want mass converted to newtons, we just multiply by gravity. Force is mass times acceleration. So that then tells us that work, work is the integral of force. And if we're dealing with a spring, that's what we have to find the work. And now we can compress or stretch the spring and figure out how much work is done in that task. So how much work is required to compress it four centimeters from equilibrium. So if we're going to start here at zero, we want to compress it four. You can put a four or a negative four because we know already that it takes the same work to compress as it does to stretch. There is symmetry. If you compress the spring two centimeters or stretch it two centimeters, same amount of work. And it's going to come out in the wash whether you put a 4 or a negative 4 there because when you integrate this, you get x squared. So it's not going to matter. If you want to match the problem exactly and it's saying, oh, we're compressing, then you can put the minus there. It doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. Wouldn't it be 0.0? Oh, yes, thank you. Yeah, we're, we, want to be in, we want to be in meters. Thank you. So we could put the negative or the positive. It's not going to matter because it will come out in the wash. Right here, as soon as we integrate. We put a positive or a negative, we square, it's going to be gone. The minus sign will be gone. So plugging in 0 gives us nothing. So we're going to take that number. We're going to divide it by 2. And then we're going to um, multiply by 
0.04 squared. And I'm coming up with 274.4, which is 1372 over 5 units, or if I need work, joules. If they're exact, yeah. Yeah, so if you wrote that as that exact decimal, totally. Yeah, just don't approximate. Well, Unless it says to. Yeah, are, are, are we going to do any of like, the scientific notation on the test? Because that's like on the homework. You, you can put it in scientific notation if you want, but I don't care. Okay. Yeah, either way. Yeah, either way is fine. All right, let's get to a trough for a wall. Let's see, so. Unless someone has a question on the spring. So let's do work. Let's go with, um, let's go with the cone first. <clears throat> so that is filled with water. And we want to uh, pump the water right out of the top. So we're imagining the valve is right at the top. We're just going to pump it straight out of the top. There's no extra distance that it's going to travel. <clears throat> we first think of our generic work formula, and that is the integral of ADD volume. This is going to be our generic formula anytime we're trying to find work for a pumping problem. <clears throat> and all we have to do is fill in the blanks. So acceleration density distance, acceleration density distance, ADD, acceleration density distance. And volume is not the volume of the tank. It is the volume of a representative slice at height y. So we have a slice of water at height y, and it has a cross-sectional area. And when we multiply by the thickness, we're getting this little thin slice of water. We're talking about the volume of that thin slice of water, <coughs> not the volume of the tank. So it's the volume of our volume element, if you will. OK. So, we are going to have, let's put in some numbers here. So, work will be the integral acceleration, again, 9.8. Density of water is 1,000. And then the second D, the third letter there, that's the distance traveled to get out of the tank. So, when we look at this, if we put our coordinate system right where you naturally should, Y is measuring this distance right here. It's measuring the distance from the ground up to there. That's Y. How far will that slice of water get pumped? 8 minus Y. Exactly. So if the tank is 8 meters total, that distance is Y. The distance that it has to travel is 8 minus Y. What if we had a two meter pipe at the top and we wanted to pump it out that two meters above the tank? Then how far would that slice travel? 10, Ten minus y. <clears throat> now we need the volume of our representative slice of water there. Okay, well, it's a disk, right? So we have to find the area of a disk. And we know that the area of a disk is pi r squared. So we're thinking about the radius right there. That's r. And we know that the area of that disk is pi r squared. But we don't know what that radius is. That radius changes. Right? If you drew your representative slice up here, that has a bigger radius than if you drew it here or even down lower. Right? That radius is a function. So wherever we draw that representative slice, we need to come up with the radius that's applicable. So the radius as a function of that height. So the simplest thing to do, let's, I'm gonna, let's, 
Let's just draw it over here. I'm just going to take a, the cone and press it into the page. So this distance right here is 8. This point right here, because we're dealing with a 1 meter diameter, isn't this point 1, 8 right there? And then that's 0, 0. So what is the equation of this line? y equals 8x. The rod, it's going through the origin. If it's going through the origin, you know its line is mx. Its equation is mx. We go up 8 over 1, so the slope is 8. Now, do we want it presented as a y value, or do we want it presented as an x value? Yeah, we want to present it as an x value because we want to be measuring this way, right? We want to be finding that, that radial distance right there. So it's a horizontal distance. Anytime we measure horizontal, we want x to be isolated. <clears throat> and the area of our disk then, area of the disk, is pi times the radius squared. So it's pi times y over 8 squared. That is the area of the disk. So we will have pi y squared over 64. That's area of the disk. How do we turn it into volume? DY. dy. The thickness of our slice is dy. That is now volume. Cross-sectional area times a little thickness, that gives us a little volume. <clears throat> Limits of integration? 0 to 8. Now, if we did that whole 2 meter pipe at the top thing, if, so we still have the same exact tank, but we have the 2 meter pipe at the top, would the limits of integration change in finding the work? No. Because we still have water between 0 and 8. The thing that would change is that we have to change the, we'd have to modify just the distance traveled. Right? We still have water physically, though, from 0 to 8. The distance it travels, we'd have to make that 10 minus y instead of just 8 minus y. So the constants pop to the front. So we're going to have a 9,800 divided by 64 multiplied by pi. And what's left inside the integral? So that's gone, that's gone, those are gone. We have 8y squared minus y cubed, dy. <clears throat> Power rule. And then plug in your limits of integration. So power rule will give us 8 thirds y cubed minus y to the fourth over 4 from 0 to 8. And whatever that simplifies to. Plug in the 8, mash it all together, turn it to a fraction, leave the pi in there. And what should the units be? Joules. All right, any step there that you aren't seeing clearly? So the nice thing about these is that we have a very functional acronym. The ADD is pretty easy to remember. Uh, the biggest mistake I see on this is the, is the volume. And it's so tempting when you see volume to think of the volume of the whole thing. Just remember that it's area multiplied by dy. Let's take a look at the trapezoid um, force problem. We haven't done a trapezoid, so this is similar. Let's do that. So here, we're going to be finding force instead of finding work. We're thinking about the wall of a dam or side of a pool or whatever. We've got a face and water is pressing on it. It doesn't matter if it's a dam or a pool or a window in a pool or whatever. The idea is that we've got a film of water pushing on this and we want to find the cumulative force exerted by that, that, that wall of water. Let's Okay, so small dam, water levels to the top, find the total force on the dam. 
So here we're finding force, not work, and our acronym changes by one dimension. Instead of ADD volume, it's ADD area. And when we say area, we mean the area of this representative strip right there. So just a thin little area. It's like a piece of tape going across. And the area of that is the width multiplied by the thickness. The thickness is just dy. So we've got this representative strip across the damn wall. We want the force on that. And then we integrate to get, we add all the forces together to get the total force. So if we think about a coordinate system in here, put it right there. There's the coordinate system. And our goal is to find the width of this strip so that we can find the area of that strip. Horizontal element, like all these applications, horizontal element. So we need to find the equation of this curve right here. If we can find the equation of that curve, then we can figure out how big W is. If we look right here, this point is 1 comma 0. This point, let's see, if that's a 4 up there, we divide by 2, that's 2 comma 3. And that's a line that connects these two points. So we know that y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. You can pick either point, but it's smarter to pick the one with the zero. It's always easier with the zero. Now we just have to figure out the slope. So this will be y equals, what do you think the slope is? Two. Oh, I know. <laughs> Close. Three. So if we look at the rise over the run from this point, so from one zero, we're going to rise three. And we're at 1 for x, but now we're at 2 for x, so we're going to rise 3 and over 1. So slope will be 3. So there is the equation of that line. Presented as a y value, so it's measuring height. But we have a horizontal element, so we want to solve for x. Because we're trying for, we want to have a horizontal distance. So I'm going to add the 3 to the y, so we have y plus 3 equals divide by 3. Now we have x. So that x value measures the distance from the y-axis over. And that's what that measures. If you have y equals something, it's measuring from the x-axis up. If you have x equals something, it's measuring from the y-axis over. We want not, you know, it's kind of like a radius. We don't want that radius, though. We want that whole thing. So what is w equal? Two times that. So we're going to have 2 thirds times y plus 3. We'll multiply that by 2. w is twice. It's all the way across. It's not just to the middle. It's all the way across. So it's the difference between a radius and a diameter. We want the diameter here, all the way across. <laughs> OK, let's go for our, our formula here. So once again, 9.8. Once again, it's water, so the density is 1,000. OK, this horizontal element, we imagine it at y. And that y is measuring that height right there. So in our formula, acceleration, density, distance, what is the distance we're referring to? 4 minus, three. Four minus, four minus y, is that what you said? No. Four minus y? Wouldn't it be 3 minus y? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, 3. Yeah, it's the, it's the height of the dam minus it's this distance right there, 3 minus y, yeah. The height of the dam is 3, so 3 minus y, thanks. So that's the distance below the surface. That's how we're thinking of distance in this context, distance below the surface. Um, and then we have to do the area of the strip. So the area of the strip is right here. The width of the strip, let's put that one in, no, not that one. Let's put this one in blue. So the width of the strip multiplied by the thickness of the strip, that is area. So this is all of that.
And now we're ready to integrate. So what about limits of integration? Zero to three, yeah. So let's pull out all the constants, 9,800, right there. Two thirds can come out. And the only thing that's left inside, we've got this factor of y, we've got that factor of y. Foil, we must. So that's going to be minus y squared if we write it in descending order. And then we're going to have um, negative 3y plus 3y. Those cancel. So we have that as our function of y after we FOIL. And again, we come up with a pretty easy integral in the long run. Right now, we just use the power rule. y cubed over negative y cubed over 3, 9y, plug in the limits, and we, we get our answer. What are our units in this case when we're finding the force on the wall? Newtons, not joules. <clears throat> All right, any step? So for which, sure. how did you get 2 over 3 instead of 1 over 3? So the x value is 1 over 3, and then we have to double it, right? This is oh, 1 yes. over okay. 3 multiplied by y plus 3. So then we're doubling it, okay. so we're multiplying that by 2. I see. Okay. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Other ones? Um, yeah. The reason that the 2 over 3 and y plus 3, the reason it's area is because we're only looking at 1 Light. So mm -hmm. it, the area would be height times width. We have the width so the dy adds that thickness. Okay. Exactly. 100 percent So the, the width is measuring the distance across there and the dy is measuring measuring that tiny little height. Okay. So it's like a piece of masking tape. And the height of the masking tape is the dy. And then the width is the right minus the left or twice that distance. Mm -hmm. Question? All right, let's spend a minute talking about the hyperbolics. Let's, let's look at that one first. What form is that integral in? Log form. The derivative of the denominator is the numerator. You could use u substitution with u being the denominator. Or you can just cut to the chase because it's in log form. Anything in log form, log form again, derivative of bottom top, it's natural log of the denominator. You don't need the absolute values here because we know that cosh is the hanging cable. And that's above the x-axis, so it's always positive. So you don't have to have the absolute values. Let's see, let's look at that one. Let's do a derivative. So derivative of a log function, what's the generic rule? One over, one over the inside, yeah. One over the inside. So we're going to do one over cosec of 11x. One over the inside. And now we have to differentiate the inside. So we go back to our trig stuff to give us a pattern. We know the derivative of cosecant x is minus cosecant cotangent. So the pattern is going to persist over to here. Maybe we have to worry about the sign. Let's just write it there for now. So it's going to be co, uh, cosec um, of 11x times cotang of 11x times 11. That's the chain rule piece. Uh, and let's just ask ourselves about the sign. So we know that with the hyperbolics, the primary three, cinch, cosh, tanch, those have positive derivatives. All the other three have negative derivatives, so the negative should stay, because that's not a cinch, cosh, or tanch. And minus cosec, cotang. We see that there is a cancellation here, cosec 11, cosec 11x. So we're going to end up with minus 11 cotanch 11x. 
<clears throat> All right. Let's squeeze in one more derivative. So a chain rule one. If you need to, rewrite it with the four on the outside. It's so easy to blow these because you're not realizing that there's a combination of power rule with chain rule. It's very tempting when they have the four tucked in there to not remember to differentiate the base. The base here is cinch of 2x. Super tempting not to differentiate that. So let's do it with this. So we're going to have minus 4. We leave the base alone. And we subtract 3. Uh, subtract, subtract 1 to get 3. So we have that. So bring down the power, subtract 1. Now chain rule, we differentiate the base. The derivative of cinch is cosh of 2x. And then we go into the angle and we differentiate the angle. So rewriting that exponent on the far outside tends to be a good strategy if it's not totally obvious. And then this will become minus 8. And then we can tuck that 3 back in now. So that will be our derivative. Do we have to simplify Yes. Yeah, we'll say, it, yeah, definitely want to put all your answers in simplified form. All right, so Thursday, big day. Well, some of us, Thursday. Tim's over ambitious. He wants to take the test today. Anyone else want to go take it today? Okay. You're alone, buddy. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I will be checking the email. I'll be checking the OneNote thing. Put stuff in there. I will get back to you. I'll email you back if you do the Ask My Instructor. Um, I'm in the Mass Center tomorrow from 9 to 11 if you want to come in there. Otherwise, good luck studying, and I'll see you Thursday morning unless you're taking it somewhere else. Good luck on that test today. Do I need to send you an email about my I put yours in the Westminster Test Center. So it's up there ready. I just have to change Kim and then you're going to email me. Yeah. Okay, perfect. It just needs to be done by the right? Yes. It doesn't matter when that time. Yeah, have you made an appointment yet? I don't even know that yet. So super easy. Go to the website. So office hour now. Anyone that wants to go over questions, hang out. Let's do math. Because we haven't done enough today. Maybe it should be. I'm going to work, so I have to get water. I'll be back. Maybe I should just give up.